Section 11 of The Works of Edgar Allan Poe, Raven Edition, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Draconis. Melanta Tauta by Edgar Allan Poe. To the editors of The Lady's Book. I have the honor of sending you, for your magazine, an article which I hope you will be able to comprehend rather more distinctly than I do myself. It is a translation by my friend Martin Van Buren Mavis, sometimes called the Poughkeepsie Seer, of an odd-looking MS, which I found, about a year ago, tightly corked up in a jug, floating in the Mare Tenebrarum a sea well described by the Nubian geographer, but seldom visited nowadays, except for the transcendentalists and divers for crotchets. Truly yours, Edgar A. Poe. On Board Balloon Skylark, April 1st, 2848. Now, my dear friend, now for your sins, you are to suffer the infliction of a long gossiping letter I tell you distinctly that I am going to punish you for all your impertinences by being as tedious, as discursive, as incoherent, and as unsatisfactory as possible. Besides, here I am, cooped up in a dirty balloon, with some one or two hundred of the canal, all bound on a pleasure excursion. What a funny idea some people have of pleasure! And I have no prospect of touching terra firma for a month, at least." nobody to talk to nothing to do when one has nothing to do then is the time to correspond with one's friends you perceive then why it is that i write you this letter it is on account of my ennui and your sins get ready your spectacles and make up your mind to be annoyed i mean to write at you every day during this odious voyage hi ho when will any invention visit the human pericranium are we forever to be doomed to the thousand inconveniences of the balloon? Will nobody contrive a more expeditious mode of progress? The jog-trot movement, to my thinking, is little less than positive torture. Upon my word, we have not made more than a hundred miles the hour since leaving home. The very birds beat us, at least some of them. I assure you that I do not exaggerate at all. Our motion, no doubt, seems slower than it actually is, this on account of our having no objects about us by which to estimate our velocity, and on account of our going with the wind. To be sure, whenever we meet a balloon we have a chance of perceiving our rate, and then, I admit, things do not appear so very bad, accustomed as I am to this mode of travelling. I cannot get over a kind of giddiness whenever a balloon passes us in a current directly overhead, it always seems to me like an immense bird of prey about to pounce upon us and carry us off in its claws. One went over us this morning about sunrise and so nearly overhead that its drag rope actually brushed the network suspending our car and caused us very serious apprehension. Our captain said that if the material of the bag had been the trumpery varnished silk of five hundred or thousand years ago, we should inevitably have been damaged this silk, as he explained to me, was a fabric composed of the entrails of a species of earthworm. The worm was carefully fed on mulberries, kind of fruit resembling a watermelon, and when sufficiently fat, was crushed in a mill. The paste thus arising was called papyrus in its primary state, and went through a variety of processes until it finally became silk. Singular to relate, it was once much admired as an article of female dress. Balloons were also very generally constructed from it. A better kind of material, it appears, was subsequently found in the down surrounding the seed vessels of a plant vulgarly called euphorbium, and at that time botanically termed milkweed. This latter kind of silk was designated as silk buckingham on account of its superior durability and was usually prepared for use by being varnished with a solution of gum caoutchouc, a substance which in some respects must have resembled the gutta percha now in common use. This caoutchouc was occasionally called Indian rubber or rubber of twist, 
and was no doubt one of the numerous fungi. Never tell me again that I am not at heart an antiquarian. Talking of drag ropes, our own, it seems, has this moment knocked a man overboard from one of the small magnetic propellers that swarm in ocean below us. A boat of about 6,000 tons and, from all accounts, shamefully crowded. These diminutive barks should be prohibited from carrying more than a definite number of passengers. The man, of course, was not permitted to get on board again, and was soon out of sight, he and his life preserver. I rejoice, my dear friend, that we live in an age so enlightened that no such a thing as an individual is supposed to exist. It is the mass for which the true humanity cares. By the by, talking of humanity, do you know that our immortal Wiggins is not so original in his views of the social condition and so forth, as his contemporaries are inclined to suppose? Pundit assures me that the same ideas were put nearly in the same way about a thousand years ago by an Irish philosopher called Furrier, on account of his keeping a retail shop for cat peltries and other furs. Pundit knows, you know, there can be no mistake about it. How very wonderfully do we see verified every day the profound observation of the Hindu Ares Tottle, as quoted by Pundit. Thus must we say that, not once or twice, or a few times, but with almost infinite repetitions, the same opinions come round in a circle among men. April 2nd. Spoke today the magnetic cutter in charge of the middle section of floating telegraph wires. I learn that when this species of telegraph was first put into operation by horse, it was considered quite impossible to convey the wires over sea. But now we are at a loss to comprehend where the difficulty lay. So wags the world. Tempora mutanter. Excuse me for quoting the Etruscan. What would we do without the Atlantic telegraph? Pundit says Atlantic was the ancient adjective. We lay to a few minutes to ask the cutter some questions, and learned, among other glorious news, that civil war is raging in Africa, while the plague is doing its good work beautifully both in Europe and Aishur. Is it not truly remarkable that, before the magnificent light shed upon philosophy by humanity, the world was accustomed to regard war and pestilence as calamities? Do you know that prayers were actually offered up in the ancient temples to the end that these evils might not be visited upon mankind? Is it not really difficult to comprehend upon what principle of interest our forefathers acted? Were they so blind as not to perceive that the destruction of a myriad of individuals is only so much positive advantage to the mass? April 3rd. It is really a very fine amusement to ascend the rope ladder leading to the summit of the balloon bag, and thence survey the surrounding world. From the car below, you know the prospect is not so comprehensive. You can see little vertically, but seated here, where I write this, in the luxuriously cushioned open piazza of the summit, one can see everything that is going on in all directions. Just now, there is quite a crowd of balloons in sight, and they present a very animated appearance, while the air is resonant with the hum of so many millions of human voices. I have heard it asserted that when yellow or, pundit will have it, violet, who is supposed to have been the first aeronaut, maintained the practicability of traversing the atmosphere in all directions by merely ascending or descending until a favorable current was attained. He was scarcely hearkened to at all by his contemporaries, who looked upon him as merely an ingenious sort of madman, because the philosophers of the day declared the things impossible. Really, now, it does seem to me quite unaccountable how anything so obviously feasible could have escaped the sagacity of the ancient savans, but in all ages the great obstacles to advancement in art have been opposed by the so-called men of science. To be sure, our men of science are not quite so bigoted as those of old. Oh, I have something so queer to tell you on this topic. Do you know that it is not more than a thousand years ago since the metaphysicians consented to relieve the people of the singular fancy that there existed but two possible roads for the attainment of truth? Believe it if you can. It appears that long, long ago, in the night of time, there lived a Turkish philosopher, or Hindu possibly, called Aries Tottle, 
this person introduced, or at all events propagated, what was termed the deductive or a priori mode of investigation. He started with what he maintained to be axioms or self-evident truths, and thence proceeded logically to results. His greatest disciples were one Euclid and one Kant. Well, Aries Tuttle flourished supreme till advent of one hog, surnamed the Ettrick Shepherd, who preached an entirely different system, which he called the a posteriori or inductive. His plan referred altogether to sensation. He proceeded by observing, analyzing, and classifying facts instantiae natura, as they were affectedly called, into general laws. Aries Tottle's mode, in a word, was based on nomina, hogs on phenomena. Well, so great was the admiration excited by this latter system that, at its first introduction, Aries Tottle fell into disrepute, but finally he recovered ground and was permitted to divide the realm of truth with his more modern rival. The Savans now maintained the Aristotelian and Baconian roads were the sole possible avenues to knowledge. Baconian, you must know, was an adjective invented as equivalent to Hoggian and more euphorious and dignified. Now, my dear friend, I do assure you most positively that I represent this matter fairly, on the soundest authority, and you can easily understand how a notion so absurd on its very face must have operated to retard the progress of all true knowledge, which makes its advances almost invariably by intuitive bounds. The ancient idea confined investigations to crawling, and for hundreds of years so great was the infatuation about Hogg especially, that a virtual end was put to all thinking, properly so called. No man dared utter a truth to which he felt himself indebted to his soul alone. It mattered not whether the truth was even demonstrably a truth, for the bullet-headed savans of the time regarded only the road by which he had attained it. They would not even look at the end. Let us see the means, they cried. The means! If upon investigation of the means it was found to come under neither the category Ares, that is to say Ram, nor under the category Hog, why then the Savans went no farther, but pronounced the theorist a fool, and would have nothing to do with him or his truth. Now it cannot be maintained even that by the crawling system the greatest amount of truth would be attained in any long series of ages, for the repression of imagination was an evil not to be compensated for by any superior certainty in the ancient modes of investigation. The error of these Germains, these Virinch, these English, and those Americans, the latter, by the way, were our own immediate progenitors, was an error quite analogous with that of the wise acre who fancies that he must necessarily see an object the better the more closely he holds it to his eyes. These people blinded themselves by details. When they proceeded hoggishly, their facts were by no means always facts, a matter of little consequence had it not been for assuming that they were facts and must be facts because they appeared to be such. When they proceeded on the path of the ram, their course was scarcely as straight as a ram's horn, for they never had an axiom which was an axiom at all. They must have been very blind not to see this, even in their own day, for even in their own day many of the long-established axioms had been rejected, for example, ex nihilo nihil fit. A body cannot act where it is not. There cannot exist antipodes. Darkness cannot come out of the light. All these, and a dozen other similar propositions, formerly admitted without hesitation as axioms, were, even at the period of which I speak, seen to be untenable. How absurd in these people, then, to persist in putting faith in axioms as immutable bases of truth. But, even out of the mouths of their soundest reasoners, it is easy to demonstrate the futility, the impalpability of their axioms in general. Who was the soundest of their logicians? Let me see. I will go and ask Pundit and be back in a minute. Ah, here we have it. Here is a book written nearly a thousand years ago and lately translated from English, which, by the way, appears to have been the rudiment of the American pundit says it is decidedly the cleverest ancient work on its topic logic the author who was much thought of in his day was one miller or mill and we find it recorded of him as a point of some importance that he had a mill horse called bentham but let us glance at the treaties ah 
ability or inability to conceive, says Mr. Mill very properly, is in no case to be received as a criterion of axiomatic truth. What modern in his senses would ever think of disputing this truism? The only wonder with us must be how it happened that Mr. Mill conceived it necessary even to hint at anything so obvious, so far good, but let us turn over another paper. What have we here? Contradictories cannot both be true, that is, cannot coexist in nature. Here Mr. Mill means, for example, that a tree must be either a tree or not a tree, that it cannot be at the same time a tree and not a tree. Very well, but I ask him why. His reply is this, and never pretends to be anything else than this, because it is impossible to conceive that contradictories can both be true. But this is no answer at all, by his own showing, for has he not just admitted as a truism that ability or inability to conceive is in no case to be received as a criterion of axiomatic truth? Now, I do not complain of these ancients so much because their logic is, by their own showing, utterly baseless, worthless, and fantastic altogether, as because of their pompous and imbecile proscription of all other roads of truth, of all other means for its attainment than the two preposterous paths, the one of creeping and the one of crawling, to which they have dared to confine the soul that loves nothing so well as to soar. By the by, my dear friend, do you not think it would have puzzled these ancient dogmaticians to have determined by which of their two roads it was that the most important and most sublime of all their truths was in effect attained i mean the truth of gravitation newton owed it to kepler kepler admitted that his three laws were guessed at these three laws of all laws which led the great english mathematician to his principle the basis of all physical principle to go behind which we must enter the kingdom of metaphysics kepler guessed that is to say imagined he was essentially a theorist that word now of so much sanctity formerly an epithet of contempt would it not have puzzled these old moles too to have explained by which of the two roads a cryptographist unriddles a cryptograph of more than usual secrecy or by which of the two roads champollion directed mankind to those enduring and almost innumerable truths which resulted from his deciphering the hieroglyphics one word more on this topic and i will be done boring you is it not passing strange that with their eternal prattling about roads to truth these bigoted people missed what we now so clearly perceive to be the great highway that of consistency does it not seem singular how they should have failed to deduce from the works of god the vital fact that a perfect consistency must be an absolute truth how plain has been our progress since the late announcement of this proposition investigation has been taken out of the hands of the ground moles and given as a task to the true and only true thinkers the men of ardent imagination these latter theorize can you not fancy the shout of scorn with which my words would be received by our progenitors were it possible for them to be now looking over my shoulder these men i say theorize and their theories are simply corrected reduced systemized cleared little by little of their dross of inconsistency until finally a perfect consistency stands apparent which even the most stolid admit because it is a consistency to be an absolute and an unquestionable truth april fourth the new gas is doing wonders in conjunction with the new improvement with gutta percha how very safe commodious manageable and in every respect convenient are our modern balloons here is an immense one approaching us at the rate of at least a hundred and fifty miles an hour it seems to be crowded with people perhaps there are three or four hundred passengers and yet it soars to an elevation of nearly a mile looking down upon poor us with sovereign contempt still a hundred or even two hundred miles an hour is slow travelling after all do you remember our flight on the railroad across the canada continent fully three hundred miles the hour that was travelling nothing to be seen though nothing to be done but flirt feast and dance in the magnificent saloons do you remember what an odd sensation was experienced when by chance we caught a glimpse of external objects while the cars were in full flight everything seemed unique in one mass for my part 
I cannot say but that I preferred the traveling by the slow train of a hundred miles the hour. Here we were permitted to have glass windows, even to have them open, and something like a distinct view of the country was attainable. Pundit says that the route for the great Canadal Railroad must have been in some measure marked out about nine hundred years ago. In fact, he goes so far as to assert that actual traces of a road are still discernible, traces referable to a period quite as remote as that mentioned. The track, it appears, was double only. Ours, you know, has twelve paths, and three or four new ones are in preparation. The ancient rails were very slight and placed so close together as to be, according to modern notions, quite frivolous, if not dangerous in the extreme. The present width of track, fifty feet, is considered, indeed, scarcely secure enough. For my part, I make no doubt that a track of some sort must have existed in very remote times, as Pundit asserts, for nothing can be clearer to my mind than that, at some period, not less than seven centuries ago, certainly, the northern and southern Canada continents were united. The Canadians, then, would have been driven by necessity to a great railroad across the continent. April 5th. I am almost devoured by Inui. Pundit is the only conversable person on board, and he, poor soul, can speak of nothing but antiquities. He has been occupied all the day in the attempt to convince me that the ancient Americans governed themselves. Did ever anybody hear of such an absurdity? That they existed in a sort of every-man-for-himself confederacy after the fashion of the prairie dogs that we read of in fable. He says that they started with the queerest idea conceivable, viz., that all men are born free and equal. This, in the very teeth of the laws of gradation, so visibly impressed upon all things, both in the moral and physical universe. Every man voted, as they called it, that is to say, meddled with public affairs, until at length it was discovered that what is everybody's business is nobody's, and that the republic, so the absurd thing was called, was without a government at all. It is related, however, that the first circumstance which disturbed, very particularly, the self-complacency of the philosophers who constructed this republic was the startling discovery that universal suffrage gave opportunity for fraudulent schemes, by means of which any desired number of votes might at any time be polled, without the possibility of prevention or even detection, by any party which should be merely villainous enough not to be ashamed of the fraud. A little reflection upon this discovery sufficed to render evident the consequences which for that rascality must predominate, in a word, that a republican government could never be anything but a rascally one. While the philosophers, however, were busied in blushing at their stupidity in not having foreseen these inevitable evils, and intent upon the invention of new theories, the matter was put to an abrupt issue by a fellow of the name of Mob, who took everything into his own hands and set up a despotism in comparison with which those of the fabulous zeros and hellofagabaluses were respectable and delectable. This mob, a foreigner by the by, is said to have been the most odious of all men that ever encumbered the earth. He was a giant in stature, insolent, rapacious, filthy, had the gall of a bullock, with the heart of a hyena and the brains of a peacock. He died, at length, by dint of his own energies, which exhausted him. Nevertheless, he had his uses, as everything has, however vile, and taught mankind a lesson, which to this day it is in no danger of forgetting, never to run directly contrary to the natural analogies. As for republicanism, no analogy could be found for it upon the face of the earth, unless we accept the case of the prairie dogs, an exception which seems to demonstrate, if anything, that democracy is a very admirable form of government for dogs. April 6th. Last night had a fine view of Alpha Lyrae, whose disc, through our captain's spyglass, substance an angle of half a degree, looking very much as our sun does to the naked eye on a misty day. Alpha Lyrae, although so very much larger than our sun, by the by, resembles him closely as regards to its spots, its atmosphere, and in many other particulars. It is only within the last century, 
pundit tells me, that the binary relation existing between these two orbs began even to be suspected. The evident motion of our system in the heavens was, strange to say, referred to an orbit about a prodigious star in the center of the galaxy. About this star, or at all events about a center of gravity common to all the globes of the Milky Way, and supposed to be near Alcyone in the Pleiades, every one of these globes was declared to be revolving, our own performing the circuit in a period of 117 millions of years. We, with our present lights, our vast telescopic improvements, and so forth, of course, find it difficult to comprehend the ground of an idea such as this. Its first propagator was one muddler. He was led, we must presume, to this wild hypothesis by mere analogy in the first instance, but, this being the case, he should have at least adhered to analogy in its development. A great central orb was, in fact, suggested, so far Muddler was consistent. This central orb, however, dynamically, should have been greater than all its surrounding orbs taken together. The question might then have been asked, why do we not see it? We, especially who occupy the mid-region of the cluster, the very locality near which, at least, must be situated this inconceivable central sun. The astronomer, perhaps, at this point, took refuge in the suggestion of non-luminosity, and here analogy was suddenly let fall. But, even admitting the central orb non-luminous, how did he manage to explain its failure to be rendered visible by the incalculable host of glorious suns glaring in all directions about it? No doubt what he finally maintained was merely a center of gravity common to all the revolving orbs, but, here again, analogy must have been let fall. Our system revolves, it is true, about a common center of gravity, but it does this in connection with, and in consequence, of a material sun whose mass more than counterbalances the rest of the system. The mathematical circle is a curve composed of an infinity of straight lines, but this idea of the circle, this idea of it which, in regard to all earthly geometry, we consider as merely the mathematical, in contradistinction from the practical, idea, is, in sober fact, the practical conception which alone we have any right to entertain in respect to those titanic circles with which we have to deal, at least in fancy, when we suppose our system, with its fellows, revolving about a point in the center of the galaxy. Let the most vigorous of human imaginations but attempt to take a single step toward the comprehension of a circuit so unutterable. I would scarcely be paradoxical to say that a flash of lightning itself, traveling forever upon the circumference of this inconceivable circle, would still forever be traveling in a straight line. That the path of our sun along such a circumference, that the direction of our system in such an orbit, would, to any human perception, deviate in the slightest degree from a straight line even in a million of years, is a proposition not to be entertained, and yet these ancient astronomers were absolutely cajoled, it appears, into believing that a decisive curvature had become apparent during the brief period of their astronomical history, during the mere point, during the utter nothingness of two or three thousand years. How incomprehensible that considerations such as this did not at once indicate to them the true state of affairs, that of the binary revolution of our sun and Alpha Lyrae around a common center of gravity. April 7th. Continued last night our astronomical amusements, had a fine view of the five Neptunian asteroids, and watched, with much interest, the putting up of a huge impost on a couple of lintels in the new temple at Daphnis in the moon. It was amusing to think that creatures so diminutive as the Lunarians, and bearing so little resemblance to humanity, yet evinced a mechanical ingenuity so much superior to our own. One finds it difficult, too, to conceive the vast masses which these people handle so easily, to be as light as our own reason tells us they actually are. April 8th. Eureka! Pundit is in his glory. A balloon from Canada spoke us today, and threw on board several late papers. They contain some exceedingly curious information relative to the Canadian, or rather American, antiquities. You know, I presume, that laborers have for some months 
been employed in preparing the ground for a new fountain at Paradise, the Emperor's principal pleasure garden. Paradise, it appears, has been, literally speaking, an island time out of mind. That is to say, its northern boundary was always, as far back as any record extends, a rivulet, or rather a very narrow arm of the sea. This arm was gradually widened until it attained its present breadth, a mile. The whole length of the island is nine miles. The breadth varies materially. The entire area, so Pundit says, was, about 800 years ago, densely packed with houses, some of them twenty stories high, land, for some most unaccountable reason, being considered as especially precious just in this vicinity. The disastrous earthquake, however, of the year 2050, so totally uprooted and overwhelmed the town, for it was almost too large to be called a village, that the most infatigable of our antiquarians have never yet been able to obtain from the site any sufficient data, in the shape of coins, medals, or inscriptions, wherewith to build up even the ghost of a theory concerning the manners, customs, etc., 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 of the aboriginal inhabitants. Nearly all that we have hitherto known of them is that they were a portion of the Knickerbocker tribe of savages infesting the continent at its first discovery by recorder Ricker, a knight of the Golden Fleece. They were by no means uncivilized, however, but cultivated various arts and even sciences after a fashion of their own. It is related of them that they were acute in many respects, but were oddly afflicted with monomania for building what, in the ancient American, was denominated churches, a kind of pagoda instituted for the worship of two idols that went by the names of wealth and fashion. In the end, it is said, the island became nine-tenths of it church. The women, too, it appears, were oddly deformed by a natural perturbance of the region just below the small of the back, although, most unaccountably, this deformity was looked upon altogether in the light of a beauty. One or two pictures of these singular women have, in fact, been miraculously preserved. They look very odd, very like something between a turkey cock and a dromedary. Well, these few details are nearly all that have descended to us respecting the ancient Knickerbockers. It seems, however, that while digging in the center of the emperor's garden, which, you know, covers the whole island, some of the workmen unearthed a cubicle and evidently chiseled block of granite, weighing several hundred pounds. It was in good preservation, having received, apparently, little injury from the convulsion which entombed it. On one of its surfaces was a marble slab with, only think of it, an inscription, a legible inscription. Pundit is in ecstasies. Upon detaching the slab, a cavity appeared, containing a leaden box filled with various coins, a long scroll of names, several documents which appeared to resemble newspapers, with other matters of intense interest to the antiquarian. There can be no doubt that all these are genuine American relics, belonging to the tribe called Knickerbocker. The papers thrown on board our balloon are filled with facsimiles of the coins, MSS, typography, etc., etc. I copy for your amusement the Knickerbocker inscription on the marble slab. This cornerstone of a monument to the memory of George Washington was laid with appropriate ceremonies on the 19th day of October, 1847, the anniversary of the surrender of Lord Cornwallis to General Washington at Yorktown, A.D. 1781, under the auspices of the Washington Monument Association of the City of New York. This, as I give it, is a verbatim translation done by Pundit himself so there can be no mistake about it. From the few words thus preserved, we glean several important items of knowledge, not the least interesting of which is the fact that a thousand years ago actual monuments had fallen into disuse, as was all very proper. The people contenting themselves, as we do now, with a mere indication of the design to erect a monument at some future time, a cornerstone being cautiously laid by itself, solitary and alone excuse me for quoting the great american poet benton as a guarantee of the magnanimous intention we ascertain too very distinctly from this admirable inscription the how as well as the where and the what of the great surrender in question as to the where it was yorktown wherever that was 
and as to the what it was general cornwallis no doubt some wealthy dealer in corn he was surrendered the inscription commemorates the surrender of what why surrender no language can be more explicit lord cornwallis was surrendered for sausage under the auspices of the washington monument association no doubt a charitable institution for the depositing of cornerstones but heaven bless me what is the matter i see the balloon has collapsed and we shall have a tumble into the sea i have therefore only time enough to add that from a hasty inspection of the facsimiles of newspapers etc etc i find that the great men in those days among the americans were one john a smith and one zachary a taylor good-bye until i see you again whether you ever get this letter or not is point of little importance as i write altogether for my own amusement i shall cork the ms up in a bottle however and throw it into the sea yours everlastingly pundita end of section eleven recording by draconis the real basement dwellers podcast will work for money dot net